Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Well, good evening. I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Psychology Department here at the University of Washington. I want to welcome you to this, this evening's continuation of our second annual Alan Edwards Public Lecture Series. The series is presented by the College of Arts and Sciences and the University of Washington Alumni Association and is made possible with a generous endowment from Alan L. Edwards. The topics in this series serve to illustrate how psychological research serves humanity. The University of Washington receives more research support money than any other public university in the country. The psychology department alone receives almost $10 million annually in research support that helps us advance our knowledge of basic science, directly serve people in our community and around the globe, and train our undergraduate and graduate students. Tonight's lecture addresses vision and the brain, unseen complexities. Our next speaker is Dr. Mel Goodale. Dr. Goodale holds the Canada Research Chair in Visual Neuroscience at the University of Western Ontario, where he is also director of the Center for Brain and Mind. Dr. Goodale was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2001, has received numerous other awards and honors, and holds major research grants from both the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Dr. Goodell is, both, is best known for his work on the functional organization of the visual pathways in the cerebral cortex and as a pioneer in the study of visuomotor control in neurological patients. His recent book with David Milner, titled Sight on Scene and Exploration of Consciousness and Conscious and Unconscious Vision from Oxford Press, won the 2005 Book Award from the British Psychological Society and provides compelling arguments that the brain mechanisms underlying our conscious visual experience of the world are quite separate from those involved in the visual control of skilled actions. These ideas not only have implications for our understanding of visual deficits in, the neurological, in neurological patients, but also offer some new directions for the design of robots and artificial visual systems. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goodale. Thank, thanks very much, <coughs> Steve. It's a real pleasure to be here in Seattle. Uh, the sun is shining. Uh, I left London, Ontario yesterday and it was 17 below centigrade. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's cold in any language, uh, believe me. So uh, I, I'm very glad to have enjoyed uh, my walk around Seattle this afternoon. I'm going to start with a cartoon uh, which really represents what most people uh, think vision does. That is, it paints a, a picture of the world outside, a kind of internal model of the world uh, outside beyond our skin, a kind of simulacrum, if you will, of the real thing that we can use as a, a foundation for thinking about the world and acting on it. Uh, now, there's clearly no picture in our head because, uh, for obvious reasons, because that begs the question, who's looking at the picture uh, inside our head and who's looking inside the picture inside that fellow's head and so on? Uh, it becomes a, a silly argument. But nevertheless, I do have a psychological representation of the world. I, I see a world out there. I see chairs and people and television cameras and so on. Uh, this is something that's really very clear and very palpable. 
But even though I have this uh, conscious experience of a world uh, outside and, and beyond uh, uh, the confines of my body, uh, nevertheless I would submit that vision did not evolve initially to do this uh, for organisms. That vision actually began as a system for the distal control of movement. And I, I'll give you a kind of absurd example of this. This is a euglena. It's a single cell organism. And the euglena is sensitive to light so that it moves its flagellum, that uh, long string-like thing, uh, more when it's in a dark part of the pond than when it's in a light part of the pond. In the light part of the pond, it doesn't move its flagellum very much. And so as a consequence, it ends up spending a lot of time in sunlight, which is a good thing for the euglena because it manufactures food using chloroplasts uh, in its cell body. Now, nobody would argue, I don't think they would argue anyway, that the euglena sees the world, that the euglena perceives the world out there, that it has a representation of the world somewhere in a little uh, bit of its cytoplasm, or some organelle uh, inside, uh, inside that creature. You don't have to make that kind of argument. You can talk about it very mechanically in a kind of servo mechanism way. You can say, look, light strikes some kind of photochemical uh, in that cell that produces some changes in microtubules, the flagellum moves, and that's all you have to say. The, uh, that takes care of the explanation. You don't have to talk about perception. Now, human beings, most human beings at any rate, are more complicated than euglena. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that you can talk about some aspects of our own behavior in the same way that you talk about the euglena, by not appealing to perception, but instead by appealing to transformations of incoming uh, visual information into some kind of movement. So, for example, the visual system, I would argue, and this is really the bottom line of my talk, the visual system that allows you to see in that top picture there a cup and a pencil and a hand and a notebook, and to recognize, too, that it's a picture, that that visual system is a very different one from the visual system that allows the actor in the picture to reach out and pick up the cup. That fundamentally different transformations are involved in the incoming visual information, and that different parts of the brain are engaged in order to do those two sorts of things. Now, in order to uh, make that argument uh, a little more clear, I have to remind you about uh, how uh, the visual system enters the brain and, and what happens to it. Uh, of course, light strikes the back of the eye, the retina, and it passes to the uh, middle of the brain to a, a structure uh, called the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus and, and from there it projects to the back of our head uh, to the primary visual cortex. And of course uh, from that uh, launching point it projects to a number of different lobes uh, in uh, the cerebral cortex. Now some years ago my uh, colleague David Milner and I suggested that you could map this distinction that I was making between vision for perception and vision for action onto two pathways that leave primary visual cortex and proceed into the other lobes of the brain. And that the one moving dorsally, marked in red here, uh, that's moving up into the parietal lobe is involved in controlling uh, our actions, the visual control of our actions, allowing the actor to pick up the cup whereas the stream that's uh, flowing downwards, blue, down to the temporal lobe, uh, is involved in transforming that information into the representation of the world that we enjoy and experience. That our psychological representation of the world depends upon that pathway, the pathway, uh, the so-called ventral stream. The ventral stream because it's at the bottom of the brain, and the dorsal stream, the red one, uh, because it's in the top or dorsal part of the brain. Now, of course, all, all I've said now is an assertion. I haven't given you any evidence that this is the case. And I want, I want now to do that. I want to provide you with some evidence uh, for, for this uh, particular conclusion. And I want to begin uh, with someone who really, uh, for us, was the Rosetta Stone, allowed us to unpack this argument and understand how the dorsal and ventral streams were involved in these separate kinds of transformations. Uh, vision for perception on the one hand and vision for the control of action on the other. And this was a young woman at the time, patient DF, who had the misfortune to suffer hypoxia from carbon monoxide poisoning. She was taking a shower uh, in Italy. She's English, she lives in Italy. And she was taking a shower in a bathroom where the heater was improperly vented. It was one of those old propane heaters which comes on when you turn on the hot water. If you've been to Europe, you may have experienced these. The water goes through a coil through a propane flame and is heated uh, on the spot and comes out the shower. Well, this one was improperly vented 
carbon monoxide, which is colorless and odorless, built up in the bathroom, and she was overcome uh, and passed out. Now, she would have died had her husband not found her and rushed her to hospital. She was in a coma for uh, a day or more, but when she emerged from the coma, it was clear that she had really profound visual problems, which I'll get to in a moment. An MRI that was taken of her brain, a structural MRI of the uh, anatomy of her brain, revealed damage in what we now know is the ventral stream, in the ventral lateral regions of the occipital lobe, which is part of the ventral stream. But the problem that DF had is a problem called visual form agnosia, not knowing form. She cannot recognize the form of objects on the basis uh, of visual input. She can't use vision to discover the form of objects. So when she looks at things, she cannot tell what they are on the basis of their form. And you can't explain this deficit in her brain or in her abilities by appealing uh, to some kind of low-level retinal deficit. Because if you test her clinically, if you test her uh, in the optometry clinic, you'll find that she has full visual fields, that she has reasonable acuity, it's in the normal range, and the kinds of profound deficits that she has cannot be accounted for by appealing to some kind of retinal problem. So what is her problem? Well, if you show her a line drawing like this of an apple or an open book, and you ask her what they are, she has no idea. Of course, form is the only defining feature here. That's the only way you can understand what those drawings are, is by looking at the uh, contours that are uh, represented in the drawing. And she can't use that information to get to the meaning of those objects. But it's not because she has a disconnection somehow, that she can't find the right words or meaning. She sees it, but she just can't label it. It's not that at all, because if you ask her to copy what she sees, these are her copies. And I think you'll agree they are pretty poor copies. But notice that she gets some of the detail so that when she draws what uh, is the open book in that uh, drawing on the left, you'll notice that she puts in some of the elements uh, that she can see there even though they're poorly organized and she has no idea what it is that she's drawing. Now, this is not because she cannot draw, because if on a quite separate day you say, draw me an apple, draw me a book, draw me an open book, then this is what she draws. Now, they're not terrific drawings, but nevertheless, they're certainly better than the ones that she, uh, she did when she had a model to copy from. So, in fact, uh, one reason they're not so good, of course, uh, the ones uh, the, the, that she draws uh, on the basis of her long-term memory of apples and open books, or her, her, her memory of what books and apples might feel like, is because she doesn't see her own drawings. Because if you show her her own drawings later, she has no more idea what they are than she does the ones that are on the left. She's kind of drawing metaphorically with her eyes closed. And sometimes when she lifts a pen from paper and puts it down, she puts it back in the wrong place and can't connect up the lines properly, even though she proceeds in a kind of reasonable way as far as the rest of the drawing is concerned. Now, it's her form that's affected. It's not her perception of the material properties of the object. So if you put this uh, kind of Walmart special in front of her and you ask her what is it, then she'll say, this is exactly what she said, it's taken from a transcript, it's made out of metal. Is it aluminium, she says. She's English after all. <laughs> it's got red plastic on it. And then she makes an educated guess, is it some kind of kitchen utensil? Because of course she has no idea what it is on the basis of its form, even though she can see the material properties. If you put it in her hand, she immediately says, oh, it's an electric torch, which is the uh, English person's quaint uh, term for a flashlight. <laughs> so her deficit then is one in recognizing the form of objects. Her deficit actually is so profound that she can't tell you whether an object is being held vertically, horizontally, or on a slant. So if you hold up a pencil and you say, how am I holding it? Am I holding it upright? Am I holding it on a slant? Am I holding it to horizontally? She might guess it right or she might guess it wrong. She just cannot uh, reliably tell you what the orientation of the pencil is. She'll see the color. She'll say, it's yellow. I is it a pencil? Because, of course, pencils have a kind of distinctive yellow color and specularities and so on, but she cannot tell you the orientation. But remarkably, when she was being tested one day, she said, let me see that. And she reached out to grab the pencil, and lo and behold, her hand 
was oriented in the correct orientation. Even though she could not see the orientation or perceive the orientation of the pencil, her hand moved towards the pencil such that if it was being held vertically, then she grabbed it this way with her hand oriented this way. And if it were being held horizontally in flight, she rotated her hand correctly so that she didn't fumble when she reached the pencil. So on the basis of this, I mean, scientists, uh, you, you can have all kinds of anecdotal accounts like this, and, and, and uh, they're all very interesting, but uh, that's not going to cut it uh, with a scientific editor of a journal. So you've really got to do some uh, more detailed observations. And so for that reason, uh, we, we brought her to my, to my lab in Canada. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm playing into your prejudices here. I, I know I am. This actually was not a, 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 a is not my lab. It was a fire in the middle of January at the old YMCA, and that was uh, what, what happened when the firemen's uh, hoses were finished. Anyway, we brought her to my lab, uh, and uh, we tested her on this slot task. And on this slot task, uh, what we're doing is asking her two things, and I'm going to tell you about each of them in turn. First of all, we asked her to give us. Uh, some perceptual report, some account of what she saw by rotating a card that she held in her hand to match the orientation of the slot that she saw out there. I think it's oriented this way. I think it's oriented that way. I think it's oriented this way. And when you ask her to do this, um, what, what we've done here on these polar plots uh, is to put uh, the uh, correct orientation in all the trials to vertical. And what you can see is that she's really hopeless. She's all over the place. She cannot orient her, her hand to the orientation of the slot. But for a normal person, of course, it's a trivial task. Yeah, it, it looks like this. It looks like this. It looks like this. For you or me, it's a trivial task. For her, she cannot do it. But you change the task now. This is the second task. You change the task and you say, look, don't uh, show me what the orientation is. I know you can't see it, but just uh, humor me and post the card into the slot rapidly. And when you do this and you ask her to post the card, what you see is that she's able to post the card into the slot even though she cannot tell you, even by just rotating her hand, what the orientation of the slot is. Now this is not because she's getting up close and comparing her hand to the orientation of the slot because you can do this in what we call visual open loop. That is, as soon as she starts to move, you can turn the lights off. So she has no control while she's moving, and she's still pretty good. She's as good as you'd be. You're not as good either when you turn the lights off, but you're still you know, pretty good. You're getting the right orientation, even though you might not get it right in. And that's exactly what happens to her. Moreover, she orients in the correct orientation right from the start. So she can use orientation information to control her hand, orient <coughs> her hand movements, but she can't see the orientation perceptually. She has no perceptual representation of the orientation of objects out there in the world. Now, of course, one can ask, what about patients who have lesions not in the ventral stream, but in this vision for action stream, in the dorsal stream, going up into the posterior parietal cortex, uh, a structure that's intimately connected with the motor system and sends lots of projections down to the spinal cord and to the nuclei in the brainstem? What happens there? Well, patients who have lesions here are the mirror image of DIA. So that when they're confronted uh, with uh, a slot in this clinical test, this is work carried out by Boris Therese Perrin, a, a neurologist in France, what you find here is that the patient can tell you what the orientation is. She says, oh, doctor, it's vertical, it's horizontal, it's on a slant, but I just can't seem to orient my hand properly. She can't use vision to control the orientation of her hand, but it's not because she hasn't got good motor control, because as soon as she touches it, her hand ducks in correctly. So she can use touch to move into the slot. She just can't use vision in flight to control the orientation of her hand, even though uh, this patient uh, can, uh, who has damage to the dorsal stream, um, uh, uh, can uh, successfully report on the orientation. She's the mirror image of DF. Now, when we reach out to pick up objects, not only do we orient our hand correctly, but we also size our hand in flight for the size of the object we're reaching out to pick up. So that when we pick up this graduate cylinder, we don't open our hand as wide in flight as we do when we reach out to pick up the beaker. 
We do this without even thinking about it. Every day when we pick up objects, we scale their grasp aperture uh, to accommodate the size of the object that we're going to pick up. Now, you can ask the same question about whether or not DF, the patient uh, who uh, has difficulty using uh, orientation information to describe the world but can still use orientation move, uh, information to control her hand movements, what happens when she's confronted with this problem? So we have two tasks here, a grasping task where she's uh, asked simply to reach out and pick up the object, and another task where she's asked, show me how big it is by opening your index finger and thumb the same amount. I think it's about this big. I thought the fish I caught was about that big. That kind of movement where what you're doing is using your hand to tell you, tell the experimenter how big something is. When you do this uh, and compare it to grasp, then you get the same dissociation in DF that we saw with orientation. Uh, we track, by the way, the, the movements using a machine, an OptiTrack made in Canada, uh, that actually uh, will record the position of small infrared light emitting diodes on the hand and we can recover the motion of the hand very nicely. And when we do this, what we see on, on the right hand side of the graph, you can see that when she's asked to do these manual estimates uh, and, you, and she is uh, telling you the size of a, a, an object which is two and a half centimeters wide or one that's five centimeters wide, she's all over the map. From trial to trial, there's lots of variation and she cannot show you how big it is because she doesn't see how big it is. But when she reaches out to pick it up, she opens her hand wider in flight for the object that is uh, large than she does for the object that is small. So she shows excellent grasp calibration despite the fact that she can't use size information uh, to make any kind of inference about how the world looks. Now, we had an opportunity to test a patient uh, more recently who has damage to the dorsal stream, the, the, the pathway that goes up into the posterior parietal cortex. And this was a, a woman who had two strokes separated by a week. And one stroke uh, on her right hemisphere left her with damage here that you can see extending uh, right from the primary visual cortex up into posterior parietal cortex, sparing actually primary visual cortex. And this is her left hemisphere and you can see the same kind of damage. So this poor woman has damage to her dorsal stream. And when she's asked to perform exactly the same uh, kinds of tasks, grasp and do manual estimations, what you see here is that when she's asked to make a manual estimation, although she's not perfect, she opens her hand wider for wide objects than she does for objects that are narrower. So she has some idea about the size of objects and she can indicate that. But when she reaches out to pick up the object, even though she has that information, she uses an automatic default of opening her hand wide every time. Because of course, there's no engagement of the automatic visual motor system that can do that size calibration. It's been damaged in her brain. And so she just goes with the default of opening her hand wide on every occasion until she makes contact. And then of course, her hand closes nicely around the object. So, we have got here what uh, neuropsychologists uh, like uh, to call a double dissociation. Uh, it gets us all very excited uh, because we've got uh, two groups of patients. We've got patients who have damage to one area, the ventral stream, uh, who have problems in perception uh, and uh, have spared visual control of action. And on the other hand, we have patients who have damage to another part of the brain, the dorsal stream, uh, who have spared perception but can't use visual information, the same kinds of visual information to control their action. Now, when we were doing uh, this work with DF, um, we really had no idea what was going on in her brain uh, because we were doing this work uh, way back when in the early 1990s. And of course, since the early 1990s, something dramatic has happened, uh, about which you've uh, heard uh, something uh, uh, in uh, other talks uh, in this series. And what, um, what we have here is the phenomenon of fMRI. And what I've done here is just to plot the number of papers that have been published since 1992 when the first papers appeared. There were two in 1992. And last uh, year, of which I have a complete count, there were nearly 1,800 papers. Uh, that's nearly five a day. Uh, I've been uh, away from the lab now for a day and a half. I've missed uh, many uh, and uh, I, I probably will never be able to catch up. So when, um, 
When we were doing work with DF, of course, uh, as I said, this was in the early 1990s, and uh, uh, you know, fMRI was barely a gleam in the eye of the inventor, Seiji Ogawa, uh, and so uh, we had really no idea about what was going on inside DF's head when she was uh, doing these things. And so we had the uh, good fortune uh, to be able to bring uh, DF to Canada again uh, and do some fMRI on her. Now you've heard about MRI. Uh, fMRI, of course, uh, is something quite different. We do this on a four Tesla magnet, uh, um, uh, bigger than your magnet, uh, in uh, <laughs> London, Ontario. Uh, and this, this 4T magnet uh, is uh, been working for us now very nicely for about 10 years. And fMRI, of course, depends uh, upon uh, changes uh, in uh, local blood flow in the brain. So the parts of the brain that are busy demand more blood. And because the uh, uh, blood that's oxygenated has different properties, uh, magnetic properties, from blood that isn't oxygenated, uh, then we can pick up these differences uh, using uh, the MRI machine. And the way, uh, the way it works uh, in our lab and in other labs uh, uh, is that you take an anatomical image of the brain, say a slice through the brain, uh, and then you um, expose people to a particular condition. Uh, they might look at a particular uh, set of objects, uh, and then you might uh, present them with another condition. And you have to do this, of course, because uh, you know, the things that you're presenting them uh, with are not the only things that are going on in their brain at the time. They might be saying, gee, I wish I'd gone to the bathroom before I went in the fMRI machine, or um, it, it's very, very claustrophobic in here. I wish they'd finished the experiment. And so what you have to do is to try and get at the thing of relevance that you're looking at. And so you try to subtract away the things that are irrelevant by contrasting these two uh, differences uh, in these different conditions. And then you take the difference and you can actually superimpose it as a false color image on the anatomical image. And that's, in a sense, what uh, you end up with in all the pretty pictures uh, that uh, fill the pages of sci uh, popular scientific magazines. So just to make it real, <clears throat> you can be interested in, the, in object recognition. What areas of the brain are involved uh, when we recognize objects? So you can show people pictures of intact objects uh, in which you can see real shapes. And then on another time in the magnet, you can show them pictures of scrambled objects in which you've mixed up all the objects. And you can contrast the two conditions. And when you do this, you find this area at the back of the brain uh, that's uh, actually activated when this occurs. And you can actually take these many slices through the brain and you can mathematically reconstruct them and, and show uh, the brain in 3D and paint that activation on the surface on this area called area LO for lateral occipital that seems to be involved and shown in many labs now to be involved in object recognition so that uh, when <coughs> people are recognizing objects in the magnet, this area is routinely activated. If you flip the brain over and look at the, these areas, uh, here I've got area LO, uh, which is involved in, as I just said, recognizing objects. But there are other areas as well uh, that uh, seem to be perhaps more specialized, perhaps because of the way they process uh, different features of objects, perhaps because they are actual, uh, uh, interested in those actual categories. So there are uh, areas such as this area, the so-called fusiform face area. It's not the Bill Gates area, but it is involved in recognizing faces. So that when uh, this faces are presented to people in the magnet, this area is routinely activated. And when they see pictures of scenes, this other area, the so-called parahippocampal place area, or PPA, is routinely activated. All part of the ventral stream on the underside of the brain. So, uh, if we look at the dorsal stream now, um, uh, the, 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 uh, I am going to get to DF. I I'm really want to take you over a little tour of normal brains. I'm, I'm actually showing my research assistant's uh, brain. I've been assured it is a normal brain. Uh, and <laughs> then we'll get on to DF. So let's look at the dorsal uh, action stream. Now we've already seen area LO down in the ventral stream. I've marked it in red. But we have these areas up here uh, in the dorsal stream uh, that are also involved in different kinds of visual motor activities. So that there are areas here that are involved in voluntary eye movements. So when you're at a cocktail party and you're moving your eyes over to look at someone over here, uh, that's an area that would be engaged when you're shifting your attention from one object to another. 
There's other areas here uh, that are involved in reaching, the visual control of reaching, the so-called parietal reach region. And other areas up here, the one that I'm interested in, uh, where we get activation when people reach out and grasp objects under visual control in the magnet, area AIP. So what happens when we put DF in the magnet and we look at her brain? Now remember, DF is a person who can use visual information to control her actions, but she cannot use visual information to, uh, to construct a percept of the world outside. So, what I'm showing you here is DF's brain. This is, uh, here on the right, this is not uh, activation in her brain. This is the damage in her brain that I've marked in blue. It's remarkably consistent with the area that's activated in my research assistant's brain when he looks at objects versus scrambled objects. That is, area LO is damaged in DF's brain. And when we do an fMRI study, to no one's surprise, she shows no differential activation in her brain when she looks at line drawings versus scrambled line drawings because, of course, we know already that she cannot discriminate these objects. She doesn't have any kind of understanding of them. And so it's no, not really surprising uh, that uh, that area is damaged in her brain and she shows no differential activation elsewhere. But remember, I said that she could recognize the material properties of objects so that she could understand whether objects are made of plastic or made of steel or made of wood. Well, what happens when we show her highly rendered colored photographs of objects uh, in which she can understand a good deal about the object by looking at its material properties. Will we see activation there uh, when we contrast her activation to those images to scrambled versions of those images? Well, the answer is yes, we do. The picture on the right shows you the differential activation in her brain uh, in areas that are intact uh, in her ventral stream when she sees objects where she can extract color and specularity and visual texture from the objects. But she just can't get to the form of those objects because, of course, area LO is particularly damaged in her brain. Now, the very important question, she is able, of course, to use visual information to reach out and pick up objects with remarkably good control. She's very accurate at doing this. What kind of activation does she show in her dorsal stream when she does this? So just to remind you, area AIP marked in blue here is activated in the normal brain when people reach out to pick up objects in the magnet. And when we look at DF's brain, despite the fact that her brain shows lots of enlarged sulci, that is enlarged valleys that have, uh, where there's been a lot of cell death, despite that fact, she shows activation marked in green here in that very area that's involved in normal people in the visual control of action. So uh, what's wonderful here is that there's been a remarkable convergence of the earlier neuropsychological observations that we made on this new fMRI data, uh, again confirming the idea that there are two visual systems, one for the visual control of action on the one hand and the other for erecting or constructing our visual perception of the world on the other. But of course, in making uh, this demonstration, in perhaps convincing you on the basis of fMRI uh, or work with neurological patients that there are two visual systems, it still begs an important question, why are there two visual systems? I mean, why couldn't we have just one general purpose visual system that does the job for action and perception? Why do we have to divide up the task like this? Well, I think the answer to this question like the answer to so many questions, as we'll discover later, lies here. <laughs> now, you recognize this for what it is. It's a glass of beer. Actually, it's a glass of Canadian beer. <laughs> this is also the same glass of beer. And if you were in the picture, of course, you might have moved back in the picture, but you still see it as a glass of beer. Um, when you move a little closer and you get down and look at it uh, by peering at it from the edge of the table, you still recognize it as a glass of beer. And when you lean forward and look at it, you still recognize it as a glass of beer. And when you've had one too many, the last thing you might see as you fall forward 
is a glass of beer. In other words, what you've got is what psychologists call object constancy. It doesn't matter what the actual geometric projection of the object is on your retina. On the basis of context and all sorts of other things, what you do is recover the real object that's out there, the glass of beer. You're interested not in the geometric projection on your retina. You're interested in the object itself out there in the world. That's great for perception. But that doesn't work for action. Doing this is great for watching TV. It's almost a pre-adaptation for watching television because after all, you have no control over the camera when you're watching television. Sometimes the head fills the whole screen and sometimes there are tiny little figures. It doesn't matter. You make great sense of what's going on because of all the contextual cues that are there in the picture. But as a medium for action, television just doesn't cut it. That's because when we want to reach out and pick up the glass of beer, we have to know exactly where the glass of beer is with respect to our hand, and we have to know it's the orientation of the handle and so on in order to be able to reach out and pick it up successfully. That very different computations are involved in the visual control of action as compared to perception. Perception, if you like, uh, is um, in some sense relative and scene bound and kind of metrically challenged. Whereas action uh, doesn't have much information about the world out there, but by gosh, the information it has about the goal object that it wants to act on, it has that very absolute and uh, very metrically accurate. So in some sense then, we're living in a kind of an illusion because we somehow have the belief, it almost seems self-evident, that what we see out there, that when I look at this uh, bottle of water in front of me, it's my perception of the bottle of water that's actually controlling my hand when I reach out to pick it up. But the work with DF and uh, some of the work I'm going to show you in just a moment shows that that is not the case. Now this is sometimes called the assumption of experience-based control. Andy Clark, a, a philosopher who's interested in these issues, uh, has come up with this term. The notion that it's the experience of the world that actually contributes to our visual motor control. And that, uh, as I tried to indicate, is not true, as we've seen in patients like DF. Well, how can we demonstrate this uh, in normal observers? How can we show this? Well, we can show this by using particular kinds of visual illusions. Uh, this is uh, Richard Gregory. Uh, Richard Gregory uh, is uh, the doyen of uh, uh, visual illusionists. He's made a career out of showing how visual illusions can tell us a lot about how the visual system works in much the, the same way as Scott Murray uh, has uh, talked about uh, in, in his lecture. So visual illusions then are a way of probing, in some sense, the computations that the um, perceptual system does and contrasting them with the computations that the that, that, that visual motor control does. And what kind of illusion am I talking about? I hope this works. I, I, I'm going to press the button. Yes. Now this is a mask of Charlie Chaplin. And what I'm going to show you uh, is the hollow face illusion, an illusion that Richard uh, Gregory has uh, done a great deal of work with. And I had the good fortune uh, to work with him on this project. And what you can see here as the face comes round is that the back of the mask looks like a face sticking out. And then, of course, when it disappears again, you can see that, in fact, it really is hollow. You can try this at home um, uh, with, uh, with a mask, with the right kind of lighting, with a Halloween mask. The inside of the mask looks like it's sticking out. And that's because with this feedback system that moves back to early visual areas that knows about faces, it imposes a great deal of order on that uh, somewhat ambiguous piece of information that you have from the shape from shading. And it makes you want to see it as a face. We want to see objects like that as a face. So the question is, all right, perception wants to see it as a face, but is our visual motor system fooled? All right. Uh, let's wait. Pray. Yes. So. Here we have um, our hollow face, uh, which is a real hollow face that we built sticking out uh, uh, on the surface uh, of, a, um, of something that could be rotated. And we can contrast that with beside it a hollow face. And what we did was to take this, uh, this display and stick some targets on it like this. And then there's the hollow face. You can see it. And we had two tasks. In one task, people just had to tell us, and we measured uh, this uh, psychophysically, 
how far they saw the target stuck on the face uh, sticking out or going in. Where did they appear to be? And we assumed that they would fall victim to the hollow face illusion. On the other hand, we also carried out a flicking task in which we had, asked people to do a very rapid flick as though they were with their spouse and they saw a fly on the end of their nose and they went out to flick it off, a bug. Just get that bug off me. And they reached out and flicked it off. And we measured how far they went when they flicked it off. And presumably, the visual motor system should use information that is veridical. It will have, that is true, it'll use binocular information. It'll fuse, uh, it'll converge, uh, uh, the two eyes will converge on the, on, on the object, uh, on the fly, and you will be able to flick it off despite the fact that you have the hollow face illusion. And of course, you do this in what I call visual open loop. As soon as you start to move, the lights go up. So you don't see your hand either going into the mask or into the face that's sticking out. So what happens? Well, what happens is very interesting. When you look at the perceptual task, these bars here that are going off um, this way, this is the outside of the face, this is the inside of the face. And what you see is that when the face is hollow, people still see the targets as sticking out towards them because they see the hollow face not as a hollow face but as a protruding face, as an illusory protruding face. And so they see the position of the targets sticking out. But when they flick the targets off, lo and behold, they go inside the mask. Their hand goes inside the mask. Even though they see the mask as protruding, the hand goes inside to flick off the insect. Because of course they're verging on that insect. Their two eyes are closing in on it. And they can use that information to control their flicking movement. So what this tells us is that the visual motor system can use information about the real location of targets despite the presence of a quite powerful, many centimeters, illusion of depth that is being driven top down by our knowledge of faces. So the visual motor system escapes this um, top down uh, interference, as it were, uh, with these cues. Now, in everyday life, of course, these two systems, I've been talking about them as though, um, as though they were, um, you know, to use a Canadian uh, metaphor, two solitudes. But in fact, uh, they do work together. Um, in, I'll explain that metaphor to you later. Uh, in, in everyday life, they work together in the production of adaptive behavior. How do they work together? Well, let's look at a metaphor from engineering. Human beings have sent robots to Mars. Uh, the Mars rovers are still working many, many months beyond what we thought they were going to do. And that's, of course, because we didn't send them to Mars as autonomous robots. We didn't program them and just send them there and let them do their job on the basis of scripts that very bright uh, uh, programmers uh, wrote on Earth. We didn't do that because, of course, we couldn't anticipate all the things that might happen on Mars. I mean, one thing that might happen, for example, uh, is that they might have encountered a Martian. And if they hadn't uh, programmed that uh, inevitability, uh, then uh, as a consequence, uh, things could have gone awry. So you can't send autonomous robots to Mars. Now what you could do is what's called teleoperation. You could have a human operator on Earth looking through a video camera mounted on, the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on a slave robot and giving instructions to the robot, move five paces forward, pick up the rock, and so on. This would not work very well because, of course, there's a huge delay. Uh, and also, the operator wouldn't have a sense of scale, wouldn't know uh, exactly the size of those boulders on Mars and so on. So it wouldn't know how far to tell the, uh, the robot to go. So that wouldn't work. So what do the engineers do? Well, they do something called teleassistance or supervised control. So what they do uh, is that the human operator indeed looks at the surface of Mars through a video camera mounted on the, uh, on the robot, but the robot is a semi-autonomous robot. And this robot um, is able to respond to commands, but the human operator looks at uh, the surface of Mars, sees an interesting object, and then just communicates symbolically with the autonomous, semi-autonomous robot and says, pick up that rock. And then the robot uses an onboard rangefinder, a laser rangefinder, looks at the distance, moves forward, activates uh, various things to, to uh, calculate the size of the object, and reaches out and picks it up. That's exactly what the human brain does. So we have this system in our ventral stream that is remarkably 
attuned uh, to the meaning of the world. We see the world in all its rich context and detail. We understand it. But it's really, as I said, metrically challenged. And so it recognizes the target. It recognizes even the part of the target that it's interested in. But when it comes to picking up that target, the knife, it hands off that task to the dorsal stream, which does that just-in-time computation to actually calculate how far the, uh, the, to move the hand and how much to open the grip in order to successfully grab the knife. So in some sense, then, both systems, one directly and one indirectly, are working on behalf of acting on the world. I want to quote um, uh, one of my favorite biologists, T.H. Uh, Huxley. I, I mean, completely out of context. But the words uh, somehow apply, I think, to the point I'm trying to make here. That the great end of life is not knowledge, but action. That is, the brain evolved to make us act on the world. And a brain that thinks and doesn't move us is a very useless brain. The brain has got to somehow move us around so that we can produce actions upon which natural selection can operate. And that's the only way the brains are going to move forward. So uh, in some sense, then, uh, cognition is a handmaiden, or perception is a handmaiden to action. I'm going to end there with that uh, provocative thought and um, just thank uh, an awful lot of people uh, who uh, did all the real work uh, and uh, a little plug for my book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goodale. We have a time for a few questions, so if you want to work your way to the microphones on either side. Um, I have a question. Um, you've made the point that the, the visual system that's guiding action is separate from the visual system that's guiding perception. Yes. And in the case of DF, the patient that you've heard about, uh, she's not able to report perceptions uh, accurately. Yes. But you know, it, it's, Scott Murray has shown that, that there are aspects of our cortical visual processing that can feed back and influence earlier areas. And I'm wondering yes. what sort of, if you have seen any sort of evidence of this action system being able to help in any way the perception system. So yeah. does DF's perception of the orientation of a pencil get better after she's able to grasp it, or are there other yes. kinds of feedback that are more profound? Excellent question, because, of course, when we first tested her, which was over 10 years ago, we got a sharp dissociation between, for example, having, uh, asking her to show us what the orientation is versus having her post the card. If we tested her now, she wouldn't show that dissociation. For some of the reasons uh, you've just described, not so much with the classical feedback uh, to early visual areas, because of course those are quite damaged in her, or when LO is damaged and the feedback from LO is damaged, but the action system itself uh, can cross cue. So in fact, we can see her making incipient movements. So when she wants to tell us now what the orientation of the slot is, we see her, we can film it, we can see her doing these little movements that she somehow engages her motor system, even if she doesn't engage it fully. And by doing so, uh, she can, in some sense, uh, trick us and perhaps herself in thinking uh, that she understands what the orientation is. Because she indeed can report the orientation much more accurately now, but it's not the way you and I are doing it. She's doing it through some kind of visual motor cross-cueing. OK, thank you. Do we have a question here? You said the hollow face experiment was a binocular? Was binocular? So it was binocular, yes. So if the person were to close one eye, would the same thing happen? Or? No, it doesn't happen. Uh, so. In fact, I could have spent quite a bit of time on the hollow face solution. So that when uh, the person closes one eye and their head is fixed, so they cannot use motion parallax, which of course can substitute for binocular vision. That is, the world shifts uh, relatively objects that are near and far when you move your, move your uh, head. Then uh, what happens is that uh, people undershoot in just the same way as they do in perceptual report indicates that the targets are closer. Excellent question. So it is virgins, and it's binocular vision. So question over here. Hi, so you have a distinction between the dorsal and the ventral streams, and there's an implication in that that your ventral scheme cares more about shape, weights cues that are good cues for shape more heavily, 
dorsal stream cares more about action, weights cues that are, gives cues about absolute distance and depth more accurately. Do you think that, how clear do you think that the mapping between, dis difference between absolute depth and shape maps onto these different distinctions? Or do you think there's just sort of a preference for one sort of way of seeing the world in one stream versus the other, if that makes any yeah. sense? I, okay. Well, I think, yeah, it's sort of a question about uh, transformations versus input differences, right? And I think it's a bit of both. So the, there clearly are some input differences. So that, for example, the dorsal stream gets a largely magno projection, that is, largely projections from big fat cells in the retina that don't have uh, very, very good acuity, although there is uh, input from some of those uh, cells that uh, carry uh, some of the high acuity information. But the, the ventral stream gets both, of course, in about equal proportions. So there's some differences in input. But the emphasis I want to make is on the transformations. That is, with, uh, say, similar kinds of input, for the sake of argument now, what happens is that the visual motor system transforms that into a set of motor coordinates, whereas the perceptual system does something else with it, perhaps combines it with stored templates and other contextual information, and erects uh, a representation of the world uh, that in some sense is uh, quite a different product than, than what happens with visual motor control. Question over here. Do uh, other parts of the brain take over the damaged area of mm. either of those areas um, and uh, yes. fulfill that function yeah. for them? Well, that, that's a, a question that clearly a lot of labs around the world are very interested in, be, uh, in part because uh, as we grow older, our chances of, of uh, suffering some kind of brain insult or disease uh, increases uh, quite a lot. And the baby boomers in, in North America are clearly um, hoping that this research is going to pay off. <laughs> So, so I, I'm getting to the answer to the question. I think your question really is, how plastic is the adult brain? So if we damage part of the brain, can other parts of the brain somehow take over the function in a very meaningful way, not just short-circuiting and performing things in a different way, but somehow take over the function of that area that's damaged? Uh, and I th just not compensating. Yeah, not, yeah so it, it, it's, it's actually recovery rather than compensation. Mm -hmm. And Well, the answer is that um, that we don't know, uh, but we hope that the brain is much more plastic than we thought it was. All of the evidence that's accumulating over the last 10, 15 years uh, points to it being far more plastic than we ever imagined. It, it's, uh, I mean, when I was a graduate student, the argument was that you were born with uh, a certain number of neurons, they died, and that was that, and uh, um, you know, um, just, just hang on while you can. But now, I, I think, there's a lot more emphasis on recovery and plasticity and indeed uh, uh, an exploration of all the kinds of cocktails uh, of medicines that could be given that would promote neuronal growth and so on. But just promoting neuronal growth itself is not enough. You have to educate that, that new tissue and it's got to really show good recovery, not just uh, um, somehow be there as, a, um, as an add-on that isn't doing anything. That's right. Okay. Okay, question over here. Yeah, have you seen any research to the effect of if people, if a person is to, say, close their eyes and then attempt to orient their hand to an object? Yes. Or having seen it or having not seen it, um, what parts of the brain would be involved? Are the same parts of the brain that are involved in the action? of grabbing or is there? Excellent question. Um, so the question is, uh, when we're working in real time, actions often happen in real time. We pick up cups when they're there. But there are some situations where, uh, for example, we're going to get into bed and we turn off the light uh, and we move towards the bed that we somehow have to store uh, the image of where the furniture and stuff uh, are so that we don't uh, trip over them in the, uh, on our way to the bed. I think what happens here is that those kinds of uh, memories of layout and so on, or even memories of an object uh, where you look at it and then you turn and then you reach with your eyes closed, I think those engage the ventral stream more. That is, that's an actual uh, uh, direct contribution of the ventral stream to action. It's able to store in sort of world-based coordinates the location of objects so that we can use them later. Um, so that when I am moving around here and I want to go back, for example, uh, to my, uh, my uh, uh, bottle of water, 
I don't have to remember where it is in all of these egocentric coordinates. I can remember that it's just on the desk uh, and then move towards the desk and then that's uh, where I'll find my bottle of water. So I think that the relationship between memory and the ventral stream is much more profound. I think that the, relation, that the dorsal stream has uh, really a very limited memory and it, uh, it participates uh, when the action is performed but it gets its input from the ventral stream. Interesting, and that would probably suggest that if you're moving through a field of objects and you noticed something out of the, your periphery but weren't really paying attention to it, that as you approached it, you suddenly might go, oh, whoa, watch out, there's something right there. Oh, in fact, well, and we're well equipped to do that, of course. We have um, uh, sets of detectors that I, I haven't even discussed that are not even in the cerebral cortex that uh, presumably are engaged when suddenly uh, stimuli are presented in the periphery of our visual field or sounds occurred, we orient very, very quickly and then bring to bear uh, uh, the rest of our, our, you know, our, our central vision uh, on that to help identify it. Is it, is it, is it foe, uh, is it friend? Okay. Neat. Question over here. Yeah, I was wondering how DF's brain injury has affected her ability to read. Uh, yes, interesting question. She um, cannot read single letters. Um, she gets, amazingly, some word form better than chance. That is, if you show her long words, uh, she has no confidence in this, but she's able to guess what they are better than chance. Now, don't forget, she has a lot of the area in, in the ventral stream spared. Her damage is very much in area LO. And it could be that parts of the so-called word form area that were spared in her brain that uh, uh, are, um, uh, have been localized in, in normal brain uh, is still able to function, although not optimally by any, by any stretch. She cannot read is the basic answer. But when you fa face her with a kind of yes, no guess, then uh, she's better than you'd expect on the basis of chance. Hmm. Question over here. Are there any theories about the age of the different portions of the brain that relate to what you're doing here? Like is the, the ability to grasp older than the ability to... Excellent question. Uh, developmentally, um, there is in the monkey uh, some lovely work by Jocelyn Beauchevalier who's uh, uh, in Houston. Uh, she, uh, uh, a Canadian compatriot, um, <laughs> has done some work in young infant monkeys and has shown that uh, the maturation of the projections that go from early visual areas up into the parietal cortex uh, come in um, uh, at an uh, earlier time than do the projections that go down to infratemporal cortex to the ventral stream. So there's a developmental difference. Um, and also, uh, uh, but this is conjecture on my part, my guess is because all animals have to move, that the dorsal stream or some kind of dorsal stream-like thing would have evolved before uh, these high-level perceptual representations of the world, which I imagine are much more necessary in social creatures that have to talk about the world and communicate and have shared experiences and so on. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for your questions, and please join me again in thanking Dr. Mel Goodale.